Hi, thank you for coming to this seminar. We have here Hannah Wolf, that he has mentally come to our unit, the tobacco control unit, to have this seminar about cannabis and tobacco. She is a PhD student from the Kids College University, and she's going to present us part of her PhD studies. And there are the, she is doing research on uh, users who are users of cannabis and, and tobacco. And as you may know, now it's uh, Although we are a tobacco control unit, the use of cannabis, at least in Spain, is very uh, connected with the use of cannabis. So, although our main focus now is uh, or has been cannabis, uh, tobacco, cannabis is also a good uh, part of our research because we are conducting also research now with cannabis users. So, we are going to learn a lot about her research, and of course, if you have any question, you can. Raise your hand and ask Hannah about uh, your doubts, okay? So, Hannah, thank you for coming mm -hmm. and you have your the floor. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. It's it's very exciting to be here um, in Spain and at ECO. I've heard a lot about ECO over my time as a tobacco researcher. I'm um, also a mental health nurse by background um, and I have, in the last two years, been carrying out a PhD full time. I'm just starting my final year, though I am also about to start a job, so I will switch to studying my PhD part-time and start work in a clinic for people with psychosis who also use um, cannabis um, to deliver an intervention to help them quit cannabis. So, of course, I'll be very keen to encourage them to also quit tobacco as well. And thank you. Um, Christina for the introduction and well the invitation and introduction um, highlighting the correlation between uh, tobacco and cannabis use and if you go away with nothing else from today's seminar I hope it um, encourages you to think that uh, if you come across uh, particularly a young adult who is using tobacco then you may well also come across a cannabis user if you come across somebody who uses cannabis then it is very very likely that they are also a tobacco user. So I'm here, um, I'm a PhD student at the Florence Nightingale Faculty of Nursing in King's College London and I'm supervised by um, Dr. Maria Jose Duasso, you can tell from her name, she's also from Spain, and uh, Professor Anne McNeil, who many of you will know from also from King's College London, she's part of the Nicotine Research Group, so I'm not part of the group but I am attached, I have attached myself to that, to that group. And I'm here with... Um, I received funding from the Society for the Study of Addiction, which is a UK charity which funds, provides travel awards for people. And early on in my PhD, I learned about Evict, which is a Spanish group. Um, some of you may have come across them already, or may have met them in Toledo last week at the CNPT. Um, so it's a working group that is set up to look at tobacco and cannabis co-use. And it was very exciting for me to come across this group. It's uh, um, really the, the kind of only one I know of who's, who's really focusing on this topic within Europe. So it was, um, I wanted to come and meet more co-use researchers um, here in Spain. Um, and I was also interested to come and meet, meet Christina, who's done lots of work with um, encouraging uh, the implementation of smoking cessation by nurses um, within healthcare settings, because as a nurse that's something I'm very keen on looking at, though it's not the focus of my PhD. Okay, um, so I will start by explaining uh, a little bit about the rationale for my PhD study um, and then give a brief background with a bit of context for about tobacco and cannabis use in the UK and in Spain. Um, for my PhD I'm doing three studies, one of which is a systematic review, so I'll present the findings from that. Um, I've just uh, almost finished a, um, a survey uh, which is focused on young adults who are also co-users and, um, and I'll explain a little bit about what I'm doing for the remainder of my time. So why tobacco and cannabis? So I started off in my master's doing a project that was looking at smoking cessation amongst people with a substance misuse disorder and as you can see from this uh, picture up here uh, these are UK figures, so the, in the UK around 15, perhaps 14 percent of people smoke, but amongst people with a substance misuse disorder, almost everybody smokes, so it's, there's a very, very high um, discrepancy between the two. 
And during the course of my study, which was looking at smoking cessation amongst people with substance use, I was struck by the fact that uh, there wasn't at that time a lot of research looking at tobacco and cannabis use. And I thought, given that they are so commonly co-used, I was surprised. So that was the kind of reason for looking more into it. Um, so we, they are very, very commonly used, but they are um, clinically, they are separated. So I'll come on to explain a bit about how tobacco use and how cannabis use is treated in the UK. Um, I put here a picture of a, a Trojan horse. So cannabis might be something that people use recreationally, for pleasure, for fun, and but it kind of bound within that if they use uh, cannabis with tobacco, which is the most common way in Europe, and I think here, um, certainly in Spain, then they are also, within it is contained tobacco, a very deadly substance. So they may well eventually stop using cannabis, but they are left with a tobacco addiction. Um, and similarly, there's increasing concern about the impact of cannabis use, particularly amongst young adults, um, given that certainly in the UK the number of people seeking treatment for cannabis use has increased, even though the numbers of people using cannabis have stayed relatively the same. There are also some uh, quite recent evidence demonstrating that the potency of cannabis has increased very significantly over the last 10 years or so. I'll come on and explain a little bit more about what I mean by potency. And lastly, the two substances have this, uh, you know, very closely related, people think of one, they think of the other, like the bread and butter, tea with milk, that's my British equivalent example. Um, so they have this very kind of unique, I think, complex relationship. Although many substances are co-used, you know, people smoke cigarettes and alcohol, I think in particular it's very important we investigate more about what's happening with tobacco and cannabis. So I haven't, I, for the purposes of this audience, I haven't, I'm not going to present anything about the tobacco and tobacco harm, so I will assume that's taken as given. I, I thought I'd just say a little bit more about cannabis. Um, so cannabis is, is consumed, uh, or is, is bought in, in kind of two, uh, the two most common ways, and I'm, I'm mostly focusing on European ways of consumption. So hash or resin, which is a kind of soap-like substance, which is burned and then crumbled and put in a joint or a cross with uh, smoked with tobacco or smoked uh, on its own in a bong or in a pipe or high potency um, cannabis. So this is cannabis that is the, the plant which has often been um, engineered and grown in such a way as to really uh, increase the potency. So cannabis um, contains two important, well it contains many many cannabinoids but two are very significant um, in terms of their psychoactive properties. So THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, I think, <laughs> and CBD, cannabidiol, um, and these two components have more or less opposing effects. So it's the THC which can um, create uh, feelings sometimes of paranoia, of anxiety, of sort of heightened tension for the person using it. And CBD has uh, an opposing effect, so it is the, it, that is what produces the kind of high, if you like, or the feelings of relaxation and euphoria and kind of um, increased sort of positive thoughts, as it were. So, historically, or, well, when, when, I suppose when cannabis was first used a lot in the UK, in Europe, um, then the level of THC was, was a lot lower, so THC and CBD seem to be kind of roughly let's say equal for the sake of argument, but what has recently happened is the way that, uh, because of the way cannabis is grown, and the THC level has increased very significantly. So people experience um, perhaps a lot, a lot more of the more negative impacts of cannabis. Am I speaking too fast or is it okay? <laughs> okay, so there are um, a number of harms associated with cannabis use. We know a lot less about cannabis in comparison to tobacco, um, and you know that there are there are also um, kind of many other sort of contexts to cannabis use. People use it medicinally. People use it for pain relief. All sorts of other things. But I just listed a few of the harms, um, and the mo I just wanted to highlight the most likely chronic effects. I'm sorry if this is a bit small. This is describing acute chronic and then particular risks for adolescents. So there's a risk of dependence, so one in ten users may become dependent on cannabis. Um, there's a risk of subtle cognitive impairment, especially over a longer period of time, of using for a long time. 
Um, and for adolescents, it is particularly risky. Um, so it, it, heavy use or, or use of a lot of high-potency cannabis in particular during adolescence may well result in impaired personal and educational attainment. So if somebody kind of not quite achieving their potential or not quite being able to hold down their college course or get a job or kind of failure to, to achieve, I suppose, um, and a potential exacerbation of mental health conditions such as depression and anxiety and psychosis. So cannabis use across Europe, um, this is measured from by the um, European Monitoring Centre for Drugs, which is based in Lisbon, and they have very helpfully provided a slide with just the UK and Spain figures on, which is ideal for today. <laughs> so in UK, uh, this is last year prevalence, so uh, the, anyone who's used any amount within the last year. Uh, but Spain is the orange, and U UK is blue. So you can see that in Spain, it's, but over the last 16 years, it's more or less the same. In the UK, it has reduced a little bit. And then this is a, the European map. Just one year. Yeah, in the last year. Yeah. Um, so here, the EMCDDA also um, produce data on who has entered treatment for cannabis use. And I just wanted to highlight this um, in particular. I'll just uh, use my fingers. I've put some red on here. So the bottom, this is. Uh, Trends in first-time entrance to substance misuse services for the purpose of addressing cannabis. So in the UK in 2006, it was around there and it's gone up a bit. In Spain, this the third one is Spain, so in 2000 it's very small and it's now quite a bit more significant. Um, cannabis users entering treatment um, are much more likely to be male. Um, the average age of first trying cannabis is 16, and then entering treatment is 25. So, in the UK, I mentioned earlier that cannabis and tobacco are used commonly together, but then treated separately. So, in the UK, we have this well-established um, treatment for tobacco service, for, sorry, for tobacco cessation, our stop smoking services, which are widely available, though used less now than they were previously. Um, and if you are on a low income or if you receive social security benefits, then you can get your prescription of nicotine replacement, for example, paid for. Um, so for cannabis use, it's a little bit different. We don't have uh, such a well-developed um, body of evidence on how to treat somebody with a cannabis use disorder. And our substance misuse services have been uh, commissioned outside of the NHS, so outside of our National Health Service, they're now delivered by third sector providers, so they're not, uh, there are far fewer services, I suppose, and they are, are less well resourced. Um, and interestingly, two point, this is uh, data from a um, adult psychiatric morbidity survey, which was a nationwide um, survey sent out by post. 2.3 of the UK population report cannabis use disorder, but of those of that 2.3, only 14.6 of those have ever access to treatment. So it looks like there might maybe uh, quite a lot of people who are using cannabis and are experiencing problems with it, but very few of those ever actually access any treatment for it. So now coming to somebody who uses uh, cannabis and tobacco in a joint, for example, if they want to quit smoking, then they may go to a smoking cessation service who may or may not uh, know what to do, who may or may not ask about their cannabis use, may or may not know kind of what, to, what to do about it or how to address it. It isn't routinely recorded. Similarly, if they um, want to address their cannabis use, they may go to a, a substance misuse service who may or may not ask about their tobacco cessation. So tobacco cessation is, in theory, provided in all substance use services, but it's it's not, not so well uh, implemented, I suppose. So for a, for a co-user, then neither service is uh, comprehensive, let's say. So I was interested in looking at the, um, this unique uh, relationship a little bit more. Um, so it operates on a number of levels. So psychologically, um, people have this kind of very strong association of the two substances. 
uh, there's some element of codependence. Uh, perhaps somebody who uses a lot of cannabis may in fact find that their cannabis use is driven by a nicotine addiction, um, which they may or may not have um, acknowledged or be aware of necessarily. And I'm interested for my PhD in how all of these factors um, influence quitting. So somebody, uh, you know, how do these operate amongst people who quit, who, who smoke both but want to quit both, or smoke both but want to quit one and not the other. So I'm trying to focus uh, less on the prevalence and more on um, people's quitting motivation and experience. So the aims of my thesis are to describe a kind of typography, if you like, of co-users, um, co-smokers, and co-quitters, or trying to be co-quitters, that's my term I've invented, <laughs> um, and to build up the evidence to support an intervention which addresses both substances. And so the final part of my thesis will be to develop a logic model, which I'll show an example of a bit later, which is the kind of components that would be required for um, an intervention. So at the beginning of my PhD I thought a lot about who to target, how to access this uh, kind of population of co-users co um, and given that there are its cannabis users are well recorded or um, within smoking cessation services and cannabis treatment services are um, don't necessarily tackle tobacco use very much, then I decided instead to ask to look at the general population and focus specifically on young adults who are the age who uses um, both of these substances at the highest level. Um, and I decided to recruit uh, students, but not university students, because a lot of research happens on <laughs> university students. So instead, um, I've chosen to recruit in what the UK are called further education colleges. So these are colleges which offer vocational courses or which offer the opportunity for adults to return to education if they didn't succeed first time round. And they have a, a kind of very, very broad range of topics and a very broad socio-demographic profile. Um, perhaps it can broader than university students. So to develop the intervention, I won't deliver the intervention within the, my PhD, but I wanted to develop the kind of evidence to support it. Um, we, in the UK, we often use this uh, development framework for complex interventions, which um, proposes that you firstly establish what evidence currently exists. Um, they then, the MRC then suggests that you carry out qualitative interviews to understand more about the context or the behaviours that you are trying to change. Um, but I've actually also added a survey in because I was given the sort of, um, given that the, the kind of group of co-users I wanted to access um, wasn't kind of, it wasn't obvious to me kind of where to start and I wanted to do a, a survey so I could get a kind of broader spectrum first of, of people's co-use patterns and motivations to quit. So I'm doing that first and then I've just started doing some qualitative interviews. And for the um, survey questions and the qualitative interviews I'm using a framework of behaviour change called COMB, which you may have come across. So um, it's, it stands for capability, there's another slide about it later, capability, opportunity and motivation. And this, <coughs> it suggests that to change any behaviour then you require each of those um, elements. And it was developed by, uh, mostly by Susan Mickey at University College London, who does a lot of work um, with Robert West, who you'll know of as a tobacco researcher as well. So, the systematic review that I carried out, um, I aimed to identify studies which had delivered interventions to co-users, and I did that by looking for interventions which were dual interventions, so which targeted both tobacco and cannabis, interventions which targeted cannabis but also reported on tobacco use pre and post, and so for tobacco studies which reported on cannabis pre and post, finally multi-substance interventions. So there was a range of targets and I extracted the, the data, the assistance of the authors on just the co-users amongst those, um, those people. Um, yeah, so preliminary, these are very preliminary results. I, I have a paper that I'm 
writing up a draft at the moment hasn't been peer reviewed, so it's, uh, it, it may it may change in the in the publication. We'll see. Um, so I found twenty studies altogether, which um, reported having uh, assessed co-use, as it were, so use of tobacco and cannabis. Twelve of which were randomised controlled trials, which I meta-analysed, and I'll show in the next slide. Um, the remainder were pilot or feasibility studies, and most of those were dual studies. So they um, delivered an intervention that was designed to help people quit both tobacco and cannabis. And they were, as you would expect, being pilot studies very, very small. But one of them in particular demonstrated quite significant feasibility. And this was a study by Becker in Switzerland. And um, this used a group format. Um, and she identified that people were likely to be not very motivated to quit both at the same time. It sounds quite difficult to quit any substance, let alone try and quit two of them at the same time. So she um, included a motivational intervention beforehand. And that, perhaps that might explain why this demonstrated quite good. Uh, the, the figure looked very low, dual acidons, so people who quit both 7% at 6 months, which in comparison to the results from the others was, was, quite, um, was quite high. So the meta analysis, unfortunately, I'm sorry, it's much too small for <laughs> showing on here, which is a useful learning point for me the next time. Um, essentially, the uh, tobacco cessation outcomes and cannabis cessation outcomes, there's very, very little difference. So I pulled the risk ratios of quitting or not quitting after the intervention, and it's 1.1 for tobacco cessation and 1.4 for cannabis cessation. So I would have expected that, um, given that most of the RCTs were focused on cannabis, then it's not surprising that not many people quit tobacco, but also not very many people quit cannabis either. So this might suggest that there was um, that, that for co-users, for people who use both, they have you know particular difficulty. Um, these are reduction outcomes. So again, the risk ratio for tobacco. Um, sorry, one last thing about this. I also did a um, subgroup analysis. So I looked at whether the target of the intervention made a difference because in terms of heterogeneity, and it didn't. It made very little difference um, to the outcomes. So going back to the reduction outcomes, um, tobacco reduction is at the top, there's a risk ratio of 1.06, so it, you know, there was no effect on reduction. There is a reduction um, on cannabis, uh, sorry, there's an effect on cannabis reduction. Um, it's not very significant either, it's 1.4, but it does um, reach significance. So there's some, there's some suggestion that people might have reduced um, some cannabis use, but overall, I suppose that the you know the conclusion are that co-users don't do don't do very well in um, in interventions which target either. So it it's I think it shows that it's very important to kind of disentangle the, to to explore the potential reasons why outcomes for co-users seem quite poor, um, and it was one of the one of the recommendations, I suppose, from this is that uh, if you are delivering a cannabis cessation intervention, it's really important to record and monitor tobacco use. And similarly, if you're delivering a tobacco use intervention, it's really important to record cannabis use because that may be having um, quite an effect on people's outcomes. Um, and dual interventions do appear feasible and our further RCTs are warranted. And measurement outcomes require attention. So we have in tobacco research, we have a kind of, uh, you know, a sort of consensus, I suppose, on how, how best to record tobacco treatment outcomes. But that's not at all the case for cannabis use. So there's various ways of measuring cannabis use in terms of the amount someone uses or the frequency with which they use. Um, and then, of course, there's all sorts of one thing I have talked about is route of administration. There are many ways in which to consume cannabis. There's many ways to co-use, so people who use co-administer in the same product, or they might smoke cannabis in a in a pipe and then smoke a cigarette afterwards. Um, so there's lots of complexities. So I've got some very very. Can we now you are going to move to the side? No? Yes. Okay.
So in this study, you will gather all the uh, evidence related to um, smoking and cannabis cessation. Yeah. And that the first two consumers and this this generation were just um, were uh, simultaneous or were consecutive. Uh, so the the, the the focus of the intervention. The, for the dual studies, yes. um, so one of them uh, was a was comparing a simultaneous and sequential intervention for both tobacco and uh, tobacco and cannabis at the same time. It was an RCT, but because the control was the the intervention was a simultaneous and then the control was a sequential, and I didn't put it in the meta analysis, but I did uh, obviously report it in the Paper. And that, so that, um, yeah, so that either um, encouraged people to, or either delivered a, a simultaneous cessation or a, a sequential by which means the tobacco came afterwards. So people were received the cannabis and then sometime, some weeks later received the tobacco cessation. But the other dual studies, they didn't report in any detail about whether they expected people to quit the both on the same day or one or the other, and they also didn't report a lot about how, to what extent they integrated the, the two, so whether they offered a kind of standardised cannabis, or standardised A cannabis intervention and then A tobacco intervention without much discussion of, kind of how the two may be influencing. Do you describe in your favour, I mean the, the focus and the approach of each of the interventions? Yeah, some. Um, not I didn't. I haven't space to in a great lot of detail, but yeah, there is there is some some of that. Um, and what are the common patterns in terms of intervention? Um, so the majority of them use uh, something like some form of CBT or, or um, motivational enhancement um, therapy for cannabis. Um, some use contingency management as well. Um, and then for tobacco treatment, they were kind of fairly standardised. Sometimes some of the studies uh, offered a single NRT, so a single nicotine replacement. They didn't offer people choice about it. Other studies did offer people a choice of um, type of NRT, but didn't necessarily. Uh, it didn't seem as if they'd necessarily been sort of highly encouraged to use it. They were offered it, so that, and they didn't often measure their use of NRT. And I imagine that would have quite. An, uh, an effect on the outcome, whether somebody did, did or not, but there was, yeah, some. Most of them were, um, some of them were face-to-face -face and some of them were delivered by computer, one was a mobile, a text-based um, intervention, yeah. uh, but the fact was the only one which used a group. Okay, so the, um, almost, uh, at the end. So the survey co-use and co-quitting. So I um, asked many, many colleges if they would be willing to distribute this survey and the vast majority came back and said no. Um, but three did say, said yes, which was fantastic. They, um, the number of students that the email, that the survey was emailed to, I think it's probably around 10,000 from each, or somewhere between five and 10,000 for each college. They haven't yet given me the the number, so it was sent to a huge number of students, and unfortunately, only 150 eligible responses came back. So it's a very small number. Um, they were invited to participate um, if they were a current or a recent tobacco user and a current or a recent cannabis user, so a co-user. Um, I wanted to try and. Um, capture people kind of in their mid-twenties where they may be more motivated to quit one or the other um, but actually most people who responded were between age between 16 and 19. Um, so I've asked them quite a lot of questions on their tobacco and cannabis use and their quit motivation and experiences of quitting one or the other. So of the sample um, they're roughly equal in terms of gender um, and I think about 60% were from black and minority ethnic background. 41% um, were daily tobacco users and 22% daily cannabis users. 
Um, the majority reported smoking joints as the most common way of smoking uh, cannabis. 8% have had quit both, and 13% have tried to quit both. Um, and far more people have tried to quit tobacco than tried to quit cannabis. So I think there's a, quite a significant differential in terms of people's motivation to quit one or the other. Um, so I dichotomize the motivation to quit into none, no, no motivation or some motivation. Um, and 63% reported some motivation to quit tobacco, but only 19 some any any kind of motivation to quit cannabis. So there's there's quite a difference, I think, in terms of how people perceive the harms and the the likelihood of dependence, perhaps, um, on on order really, on those two substances. So from this um, survey data, I then asked invited people to participate in. Uh, or to, or to let me know if they could be willing to be contacted for an interview. And lots of people said yes. Um, actually, getting them to sit down and have the interview is a slightly more challenging process, but I have started, I've done one. Um, so the qualitative interviews are essentially kind of asking more questions about the same uh, concepts of quitting and sources of support, whether they, um, kind of where they would go if they wanted to quit, would they go anywhere or do they think they would be able to stop when they feel like without anything. Um, and I use this combi framework again. So this is the behaviour change framework which suggests you would need capability, opportunity and motivation to be able to change the behaviour and that um, the opportunity is then separated into either kind of physical opportunity, so can you actually access, you know, for example, NRT or whatever it might be. Um, and uh, you know, do you have a social opportunity? So are there people around you who would support you if you were to make a quit attempt? So I based my questions on kind of filling in each of these um, uh, sections, if you like. So for example, I've asked people, do you know anyone else who has quit tobacco? Do you know anybody else who has quit cannabis? To find out a bit more about whether it's a, is it a norm for them that anyone else, any of their peers, has stopped. And then what would influence you to quit smoking or the tobacco or cannabis? So for people who have quit, what would their motivation for people who haven't? What, what might influence them in the future, for example? So, um, yeah, so that's the, the kind of framework for the qualitative interviews. So I'll then use this data along with the survey data and the findings from the systematic review to inform um, the logic model. So this isn't my logic model because I haven't got that yet, but this is a, I kind of wanted to give an example of what might be included. Um, so I would need to, I need to begin with identifying exactly what, what behaviour it is that I'm trying to change. So I've set out thinking that an intervention to quit both at the same time, or to quit both anyway, whether simultaneous or sequential, is warranted. But it might be that my findings so far suggest to me that actually it isn't. I need to do something something else first, or I'll, I'll find out. Let's see. Um, the systematic review. Um, I'm not. I don't know exactly what what that might. Uh, what kind of findings from there I, I can use, given that it found that you know there's not much of uh, not much effect for um, intervention effect for co-users, but. The dual studies in particular highlighted this issue of motivation and that that needs to be perhaps raised first. And then using the existing behaviour of change, sorry, the theory of behaviour change. Um, so uh, a finding from the um, survey would be, for example, that motivation to quit tobacco is higher, therefore in my logic model I need something that improves motivation to quit tobacco. Uh, sorry, to quit cannabis, given that it exists for tobacco already. Um, the qualitative, some of the questions I've asked, um, I will ask are, you know, would you go, would you think you need to go anywhere, where would you go to get any kind of sources of support? Um, so one of the interviews, I, or the, the interview I did the other day, for example, the person said, oh, I don't think I can, I don't have the money to go to a stop smoking service, which made me think, oh, well, okay, this is, this is useful to know, so they, you know, he thinks that it costs, so one of the elements within the intervention might be ensuring people know that stop smoking services are available.
free that you may have to pay for the NRT. Um, and then access to NRT, for example, that might be an element that I'd need to include in it. Okay, any questions on the, before I move, but I think I'm almost at the, yeah, I'm at the end, so any, any other questions on the, that's where any general yeah, questions? Yeah, I have some, some comments maybe. Yeah. Um, it's, it's good because uh, many smokers and well users, they are more motivated to be smoking than families, mm -hmm. but the studies that you have them in the view, in the systematic review, are more focused on those patients who are cannabis users. I mean, that they, they are dual yeah. users, but they go to with cannabis. Yes. So, are there studies or method analysis that include, you know, that? That I ended up in my systematic review with more cannabis studies than tobacco studies or other yeah. studies is because the cannabis study, the cannabis interventions tended to record polysubstance yeah. use. So they, they had asked people about tobacco so that the data was available, whereas tobacco studies had less frequently asked about other substance use, so the data just wasn't wasn't there so much. Um, there are other um, studies which have been done um, where they've, a tobacco intervention has been delivered and they've looked at whether cannabis use, so cannabis use might have been, or is often measured at baseline but not at follow-up. So they, they, there's lots of information collected at the start, but they haven't recorded whether there's a change in cannabis use. But they have looked at whether cannabis users do better or worse, and I think, from what I can remember from the top of my head, I think for Cannabis users who also smoke tobacco don't do as well as those who just smoke cannabis. Most of the studies were from the US where people typically kind of separate the two a bit more. Whereas here, in a <coughs> European study, if somebody was a cannabis smoker, I would think that, well, they're probably also a tobacco smoker. I think it's, I mean, it's, the consumption is dual, but there are, people have different perceptions and you are, and many of you are clinicians and maybe you can uh, maybe comment this further than me because I'm not a clinician but it's not the same being a cannabis user and uh, tobacco user that goes to a clinic to pick cannabis mm -hmm. and go to a tobacco association unit to pick tobacco. Yeah. The perception of what is your problem is completely different of what you want to quit. Yeah. And we know from the previous studies and that your study, the majority of young people, adults, they want to take tobacco, not cannabis. Yeah. So yeah. here there is an important element of, you know, yeah. who, what are the perceptions towards the importance of what is your problem yeah. when you are a dual pro, uh, user? Yeah. And, and I think it's, um, I think people who are using cannabis and want to have experienced some kind of a problem with it may want to reduce it. They, mm -hmm. Don't want to stop it altogether, whereas uh, you know within tobacco treatment and cessation is, is the usual goal. So it's yeah, it's a question of goals, and that's kind of one of the challenges of comparing tobacco and cannabis is that they are very different and measured differently, and people have different um, conceptions of them. I think I think that um, probably smoke uh, smoking tobacco is associated to higher addiction. Mm -hmm. And they perceive that the uh, cannabis is like more less addicted or less uh, more yeah. controlled. They yeah. have the question is in those uh, um, um, articles that you have uh, reviewed, um, the cannabis was a uh, cannabis use disorder as uh, dependence. They have uh, just uh, once a while, or what was yeah. it? because this is very different from cannabis use and. Yeah. Yes, and um, and I think the, the the sort of journey to developing a tobacco addiction is much 
quicker than the journey to developing a, a cannabis problem. And then most of the cannabis studies were, um, it, some of them, the, the cutoff was people who had a cannabis use disorder that was diagnosed, and for others it was people who were voluntarily treatment seeking who would have a range of, of use. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask because you you're now um, from the sample that you collected from the schools you're now interviewing these, these people, right? Yes. Some of them. Some of them. Except the ones that were up. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to know if you had a, a measure on on cannabis addiction for yes. these people. Yes. Um, uh, I haven't got it in front of me, but yes, so I've, I've done a screening for cannabis abuse, the cannabis abuse screening test, it's called CAST, um, and also the, I didn't use the Faker Strong, but I used a uh, cigarette dependency scale, which is potentially better for um, identifying less heavy smokers, so, yeah, I don't know, probably it might have been more sensible to use an FTND. Um, they weren't very high for either of those. Um, that, I mean, I've only literally done a kind of one, one overlook on, the, on my spreadsheet, but um, neither was particularly particularly high. So they're likely to be people who use, but aren't, don't, not necessarily problematically. Maybe it's because you're just it's very young. Also. It's very young, yeah. Yeah, it's very young. But, one, but when I ask about the frequency of use, it's, it's kind of quite, was quite high, it was quite, it was people use a lot, and it may be that they over report, and that is something that's been established that people, that young people often think that their peers are using more than they actually are, so perhaps there's a kind of, you know, feeling of wanting to over report, so I don't know. Um, the one thing that also was demonstrated in the surveys was quite high levels of self reported anxiety and depression and other mental health problems, so I need to look more. That I didn't present the data because I want to look more into it when I finish, but um, I think it's collected. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just thinking about the implications of that because this logic model that you want, you want to develop is, is basically targeting intervention, so you want to develop it to help. Yeah, well, see, so I suppose that's what that was my original intention, but I, I need to be guided by what the survey, what the, what the data I have tells me, and it may tell me that there isn't, um, a, you know, an intervention for this age group to address both isn't warranted, the data doesn't support that, but it might support, um, I don't know, for example, increasing awareness of nicotine dependence amongst people who use cannabis, and whether that drives your cannabis use or not, or you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, I it's it a uh, I started off with that as my aim but I I know I'll have to um, adapt. Yeah. I was about to suggest you that because of they are very young and they don't mm -hmm. have the awareness to have a problem with cannabis, mm -hmm. yes, with tobacco, with the very logic model can be can, can go and address this mm -hmm. Important of uh, highlighting the two problems that they have to addiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I guess it's it's they're they're very young and they're not yet motivated to change, but they are at the age which is at a really high risk for using cannabis. I guess, and in terms of mental health and the risk of um, of that, you know, their their brains are still developing and, and that kind of thing. So there's the, there it's as if the, the they're aware of the sort of messages about tobacco harm, but messages about cannabis harm, uh, well, uh, are not there, or they haven't, yeah. yeah. And we are find the difference between the, the um, cannabis consumption behavior and uh, the willingness to quit, uh, the difference between uh, men and women? Uh, no, I haven't looked at it yet. I want to, um, because we know that far more men use cannabis, though my sample did end up being quite balanced, so I should be able to look quite good, uh, well at that. Yeah. 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 So, do you have any questions? I want to know if you have any impression about when, they, when, they, when the co-users, when they stop doing 
smoking cannabis. Mm -hmm. uh, have you read about uh, raising tobacco use? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I ask people if, if they have had periods of stopping one or the other, what happened to the, the use of the other, and I think it's a, uh, yeah. Um, Both? There may be some compensatory effect. People, I mean, when I talk to people, they say, oh yes, I stopped with cannabis and I smoked a lot more. Um, but yeah, I, have, I, will, I will look at that because I think it's, um, I think that's quite potential for that because it's the same behaviour. And um, that may uh, that may be why people don't do so well. People who use both and quit one are less successful, or more likely to relapse to using both. Because, uh, so do you think you have been with some researchers uh, on the paper of the APP, the big researchers mm -hmm. who are devoted to the study of cannabis, for mm -hmm. example? Um, many many of these researchers are doing research with those people. Mm -hmm. So, have you detected any difference between what other researchers have done here in Spain, um, what are the results of their research, and what you have found so far in your research? In um, terms of, you know, how they consume the cannabis, the this is so quick, and so on. So, not yet, but I hope one of the things I did before, um, so I started my uh, uh, Spanish trip in Granada, and I met with um, somebody called Arturo Alvaro Roldan, who is in fact a social anthropologist by background, but is a member of the EVICT team and is a cannabis, um, mainly focuses on cannabis use. And he carried out a survey that's very similar to mine, so we looked at both of our surveys to see where they might overlap, and I hope that we can um, make a comparison. Though his, uh, his are slightly older, um, the, the average age is, is a bit older, but I would like to, yeah, like to. I think that the culture of here is very different. I think. I mean, it, it, there are it, you know the rates of cannabis use here are higher as we've seen. But I think the it, you know walking around and seeing grow shops and seeing you know it's much more um, sort of readily readily available and, and, and part of, of what you see every day compared to the. It's more normalised. Perhaps yeah. 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 And the climate makes a difference. You could grow it, we can't. It's too wet and rainy. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know it from these young people? There's a lot of them using cannabis or tobacco with them, so it's similar. Because yeah. like in England, it's a problem. I There's asked, a difference mm -hmm. in them. I asked people whether they, um, so I didn't ask a lot of uh, detail about uh, e cigarette use, but I asked if they were, if they thought about quitting tobacco, what would they do? Would they, you know, do nothing and just use willpower, or use an e-cigarette, or use NRT? Not, I think, not very many suggested they would use an e-cigarette. I asked people when they consumed cannabis, what other forms did they consume it in? And some talked about vaporizers, but not wasn't very high. Then that might reflect the age range. They're not likely to have. They may not have the resources to. Buy a product, perhaps. I don't know. But Monsa has pointed out something important because in the States that the electronic cigarettes are very popular uh, and cannabis is very popular and in some states uh, it's legalized. Mm -hmm. They're using both in combination. They're mm -hmm. using as a device to consume the mm -hmm. cigarette mm -hmm. and even the fuel mm -hmm. and then they use it with the cannabis. Mm -hmm. Not with the thing can use with the how do you say, um, concentration of cannabis without any tobacco? Yeah, the, this, the, I think the findings don't demonstrate that. I think they show most people are just using joints um, and not, not these other these other ways. And, and a, a few people have written a few comments to say, I did try concentrates once when I was in the States. I don't, I don't want to try that again, <laughs> that sort of thing. So it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, this doesn't show that, but, um, but I think we have to, to monitor because it's yeah, it's an ever changing. Yes. And yeah. this is also maybe because tool or other kind of uh, devices that are more developed and have not been introduced in Europe and they are in the United States. Yeah. And because culturally there has been times has been used a lot you know, with tobacco. And they have used the new device in their 
protein or whey uh, of protein and mm -hmm. that is separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Joel is, is, I think it's now very uh, literally in the last few months. So, yeah. So it's, yeah. So, any other person may want to say something else, ask something else to Jack? Do you have any questions for us? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are. So thank you very much for your time and also for giving but us uh, information as to what you have studied so far. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. <laughs> I think that if we study tobacco, we need to study also cannabis. Or if you study cannabis, you you need to study tobacco because many of our consumers uh, are dual. So we need to further this, this mm -hmm. kind of uh, line of mm -hmm. part of the research in our unit and you are the first one to talk about this topic in our seminars. Thank you very much, Anna, and it has been a pleasure. Thank you.